Yeah. Alright, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and uh, what you do here. Uh, my name is Tom Rosensteel. I'm the director of the Project for Excellence in Journalism. Okay, and when you look at the, the build-up to the war on Iraq, how do you ev evaluate the uh, performance of both the print and broadcast television news media? Well, uh, covering the argument for whether a country should go to war, of course, is one of the most important things that uh, the press has to do in a democratic society. Um, it's also one of the most difficult, particularly in, in a situation like this where the rationale for war had a lot to do with uh, intelligence information that was held by uh, really only a few people in the government. Um, the number of reporters who cover the intelligence community is really rather small. We're probably talking about eight or twelve or no more than twenty reporters who really cover the intelligence community in a serious way, in a full-time way. Um, so whether or not there were weapons of mass destruction, whether or not there were ties between Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda, um, this is information that was in the hands of so few people and there were so few reporters really able to um, assess that information that it was extremely difficult. This is not a situation in which you have governments uh, where the information is, is widely distributed across a lot of people and, and hundreds and hundreds of reporters could um, assess it. A debate over Medicare and the impact of, of a policy on seniors across the country, hundreds of reporters can go out and, and, uh, and work on that kind of story. Whether or not uh, a country has weapons-grade uranium, maybe there are half a dozen reporters in the country who could know. Um, and so when you, uh, can you speak on general terms as uh, when, when journalists cover issues, are they more driven by events or do they cover issues as issues over um, periods of time? Um, well, generally the journalists are better at covering news that breaks than news that bends, if you will. By that I mean when there is an event that precipitates something that is a hook to hang a story on, uh, something dramatic happens. That's what journalists are familiar and comfortable covering. Long-term systemic things that don't change dramatically over time. Um, global warming is much harder to cover than a fire. Um, and so the answer is journalists are more likely to cover events than issues. Okay. And do you see uh, anything that the press could have done better uh, leading up to the war in Iraq? Well, certainly we know that um, key organizations such as the New York Times have already acknowledged that they relied on sources uh, for information about events in Iraq who have been proven to be wrong subsequently. And that in some cases they would corroborate these sources by going to uh, friends of those sources in the government who were basically a closed circle of people recycling the same, as it turns out, faulty information back to the newspaper. And in some cases then, those same officials would go on television uh, and elsewhere in the press and say and cite the New York Times as the authority for this information. Uh, so you really had a very closed circle in which the news organizations were being manipulated consciously by policymakers as a justification for what they wanted to do. Um, can you get it? I can't yeah. see it. it but I would reiterate what I said before, that it is somewhat simplistic uh, for um, people to say, well, we should have known that there were no weapons of mass destruction there. It's not as easy as uh, some people might think because of the limited um, circulation of that information in the first place. Uh, I think there was another failure, however, and uh, which is compounded by the behavior of the Democratic Party. The Democrats basically capitulated on whether or not we should go to war, and um, so you had a few lone voices 
Senator Kennedy, Senator Byrd, and a handful of others who were making major statements uh, questioning the rationale for war. And those arguments probably were undercovered, I think, by the press in general um, because a political calculation was made by the journalists that these arguments were uh, not going to prevail and thus didn't deserve that much coverage as opposed to the arguments themselves being weighed on their merits and a feeling by the press that uh, regardless of, not, or of whether or not uh, the war was going to happen, there needed to be a robust debate among the public about it. Yeah. After the congressional resolution was passed on uh, October 10th and 11th, it seems like the debate that was happening within the international community, there was a lot of questions about the weapons of mass destruction. And a lot of issues that were bringing up that the, the media, in a way, almost assumed that we were going to war and it didn't matter. Again, I think the press tends to see things through a political lens of what will happen um, in the same way that we uh, give politicians who are running for a race. The, the serious candidates, the ones most likely to win the nomination, get the lion's share of the coverage and the people, regardless of their arguments, who are not seen as uh, viable, uh, getting much less coverage. There's a kind of real politique mentality that um, uh, dominates the press which may be more problematic uh, when the issue is should or should not the country uh, go to war. There's also a rallying around the flag effect that occurs when a president summons the nation to war, the public tends to respond, uh, the press sees the public polls, and the press tends to respond. And it was uh, probably ever thus. Uh, we know now that the predicate for the war in Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, also had problems. But we didn't know it at the time, and we certainly didn't know it as quickly as we've come to know uh, that there are questions about the rationale for the weapons of mass destruction. Um, the, a third point that's probably worth making is that, um, uh, that uh, the president has an enormous power to set the agenda. Uh, and probably more so today than uh, at other times because of the country being under attack and wanting the president to do something. Um, this is what Bush said uh, we needed to do. And a fair amount of the American public, uh, at least according to public opinion polls, although ambivalent or uncertain about going to war, were willing to give the president the benefit of the doubt. And at a time when most news organizations are under pressure, uh, that their, their audiences are under pressure, they're, they're, they have declining circulation or declining ratings, um, there's a pressure to sort of want to build up ratings, uh, to go with the public flow, to um, follow where public sentiment is. And this pressure, this economic pressure, can undermine the journalistic responsibilities that a news organization has to provide people with information even that might be unpopular. And from your recollection, do you think that the United States needed a second resolution in order for uh, the war to be actually legal under international law? Well, I, I can't. You know, I'm not an international law expert. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not, a, I'm not in the business of giving political advice. So uh, I'm happy to talk about press's behavior, but I'll well, leave that to others. I guess the question comes to, uh, you know, there was a big debate over this. Uh, France was saying that it wasn't legal, and most of the world community was, that their actual, there seemed to be covering that there was a conflict at the UN. Mm -hmm. The actual substance of the debate was not covered. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, you know, there, whether or not the country uh, needed uh, more international support uh, and should have had more international support. I think that's, that was a major issue and uh, uh, probably was one of the main issues that did get coverage. Uh, I remember certainly um, when Colin Powell went to the, to the, state, to, uh, the UN to, to make his case, um, a, a, an event that now has been sort of tarnished in, in retrospect, uh, that got significant amount of coverage in part because Powell was considered uh, hesitant about the war and because he made a forceful case, he's a particularly dynamic uh, speaker in public. That had an influence on the press as well. Um, but I think the question of international coalition uh, 
um, had got a lot of coverage, perhaps more than what is a legal coalition or what legal mandate, because I think the press probably tends to see those legal arguments as fundamentally political arguments. And I guess the, the from what I saw, there was a lot of coverage that, you know, almost attacking, they were taking the administration's word that, you know, it was all France's fault, when in actuality they were making legitimate international legal arguments. If you read Michael Gutler's, uh, some of his articles on March 18th, the Washington Post even had an article that said that most legal scholars disagree with the Bush administration's rationales. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that could have been covered back in October. Mm -hmm. Why, why is this issue of international law, why was it left until the very last second? Well, I think for all the reasons that we talked about before. Uh, the fact that the war, there was a sense the war was going to happen anyway, um, and the real politic mentality of the press, the popularity of what the president wanted to do, uh, the tendency of the press to follow public sentiment, particularly after we've been attacked, and there's a rally around the flag uh, syndrome that kicks in, and the fact that as we began this discussion, um, there's more of a tendency to cover events uh, than ideas in the press. Uh, the, s the quality or substance of ideas, the legitimacy of one argument over another on its merits is ground that the press feels to a fault, I think, uncomfortable with. Um, we know how to cover process, but covering ideas, which argument uh, is more likely to result uh, in a transportation bill in creating better roads, mm, that requires expertise. Who's got the votes? Who's going to win? Now, those are that's the area that a political reporter, where you know he or she is most comfortable. In in looking in retrospect and seeing these phenomena of institutional biases and the ways that uh, the overlooking of this aspect, it seems to me that it became the difference between war and peace in a way. Do you think that? What are some things that the journalists could do to, you know, acknowledge that there might be a problem here, first of all, but then what to do to correct it? Well, it's not the, it's not the press's job to decide whether or not the country goes to war. It's the press's job, in the end, to provide the public, uh, both leaders and, and the general public, with all the information that they require for them to decide, for the public and leaders to decide uh, whether there's a consensus for war. Um, my suspicion is probably that there was sufficient support for war um, regardless of what the press had done in the end. I don't believe that the press, uh, had it covered this event differently, would have stopped the Bush administration from going forward. Um, even now, with hindsight, uh, an acknowledgement by most that there are no weapons of mass destruction, that there was very limited contact between uh, Iraqi officials and anyone in al-Qaeda, and no proof that uh, Saddam Hussein had anything to do with 9-11. Um, support for the president and for the war effort is, is still, uh, you know, quite sizable. Well, I guess the it, the issue comes to what happens when the Democrats and Republicans agree, and there's still debate. What what does the press do? That's a very good question because while the press, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be not including my my, yeah, uh, my question. Yeah. So. I mean, there's a very important issue here, which is that the press, in the end, is much better at covering official debate uh, than it is public debate. Public debate is something that occurs around kitchen tables and at water coolers and at lunch tables uh, and in courtyards where people work and on golf courses uh, and in the stands at Little League games. Um, we're not really very good at covering that public conversation. What we're much better at covering is what House members and Senate members are arguing back and forth with each other or what interest groups in Washington on one side have to say vis-a-vis -vis interest groups on the other side. That's an elite debate that we know how to handle. Um, 
In this case, that elite debate was much narrower and more limited than the public debate that was going on around those kitchen tables. And that's a failure of the press. But it wasn't public debate, in my opinion. It was an international debate that was happening at the UN Security Council. These are debates that were happening. There are all kinds of debates that happen at the UN Security Council that get limited coverage in the American press because they're going to have a limited effect on American public opinion. Um, you know, we, we, don't, we, we can't be naive about, about this. And there is some reason to, um, you know, there, there's an understanding that uh, the Bush administration made it very clear they were going to go and do this with or without international support, and they did. And do you see that there's any economic constraints that since there are uh, news organizations have to make news that's somewhat interesting to people, and since international law isn't interesting, they don't cover it, and people aren't interested in it? Well, I think that's a factor. I mean, international law sounds like, you know, something that is even more abstract than you know, laws that are going to affect people here. Uh, you know, who's ever been to the International Tribunal at The Hague. Most Americans don't even know where The Hague is or what it is. Um, sure, I think that's a factor. Um, and it wasn't going to matter. And that's a factor. So um, when you say that is a factor, the, the economics of the situation? or what? Well, it's, that's not the economics of the situation. That has to do with how interesting that story is going to be to people. Um, the economics of the situation would really have to do more with um, I think how many reporters are are all over the story and uh, things like that. I don't I don't believe that the coverage of a single story, you know, the debate at the UN Security Council over international law, you know, in a larger sense, there's a concern that journalists want to put a, produce stories that are going to be popular, that are going to be interesting. But if we're down to the to the nature of one story, I wouldn't really call that an, an economic issue. It, it, one of the uh, principles that I see is that the, the, the job of the journalist is to make something that's significant but not interesting. It's their job to make it interesting. Right. And I, I think that's, you know, basically a core principle of journalism. What, and, sorry, and, what is that? I, 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 it, it, it is one of the core responsibilities of a journalist to try and make the significant interesting. Uh, but I think there is a debate over how significant was a debate in the Security Council over international law. Different journalists can differ over that. It's not as obviously significant as some other issues that probably didn't get covered. But, I mean, from a global perspective, you know, it seemed like a lot of other countries thought it was extremely significant. Right, but journalism isn't produced from a global perspective. And is that a problem? I mean, it, it, it seems like we're in a global interconnected community now, and, we're, and it, is it the same institutional biases of the U.S. government to only think about the United States' self-interest? Is that, you know, does the, the U.S. media just follow into that as well? If you're the Toledo Blade and your audience is in Toledo, your audience is in Toledo. So, I mean, I, you, I'm, journalism is a cultural artifact. It's produced uh, by people in a culture for people in a culture. Um, and it was ever thus, and I believe will always be. Um, American journalists are going to cover events differently than British journalists or even Canadian journalists. Uh, and if you move into another language, the differences become even more profound because of the change in language. Uh, I don't believe there is such a thing as a global journalism. Um, I don't think there is a place, a mentality that is the universal journalist. I think journalism is produced by a people for a people. And the journalism that is produced in one place ends and changes when you get to the borders of another country. I just don't see, and other people may disagree with that. I know they do. Some of the people here disagree with me on this, but that's how I feel about it. So even, well, I'm, not, I'm not specifically talking about the Toledo Blade. I'm talking about New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Wall Street Journal. The Washington, the Washington Post doesn't have any readership overseas. It's, uh, but these issues, I guess, that it, I would argue that if they were looking at international law, they would have found 
holes that Humvees could drive through in the, in the administration's case towards war. And in fact, the anti-war movement was pointing out these holes, but they weren't being covered because they didn't fit in. Right. I, I, look, I, I believe there were failures in the coverage of, uh, in the run-up to war, but I, don't, I would not get hooked or hung up over the question of just the matter of international law because, you know, lawyers will make arguments on both sides and, and, and ultimately it's not for journalists to decide which of these arguments are right. It's for journalists to basically lay out the arguments on both sides and maybe interview legal experts, but that process is, is simply one that we cover. It's not one that journalists resolve. And, and the Columbia Journalism Review, Brent Cunningham, did an article on rethinking objectivity. Yeah. Do journalists actually... I thought that you don't want to know my opinion of that article. It was a rehash of, a naive rehash of old ideas that are, I think, you know, off the mark. Um, uh, we've written extensively about objectivity and what it should mean. Um, and I, you know, I think he's off the mark. He basically calling for a more activist partisan kind of journalism in that piece, and I, I think he's wrong. Well, it, it's not necessarily it has to be partisan. If there's a right answer, what if there's a right answer? <laughs> I mean, if there's one a right answer that is very clearly determined and a journalist can see that, why does he have to be constrained by objectivity? I don't think objectivity is neutrality. And I think Cunningham in that article is mistaking objectivity with neutrality, which is an old mistake. So, in, in other words, let's say that if a journalist has a hypothesis that he wants to test and he's, he's interviewing different people and he sees that he's coming to a conclusion, you know, with the age of public relations, both sides are going to want to have their point of view regardless of whether or not it's true or not. Right. So how do you cut through public relations when you can't say whether one's... The fact is, I mean, we're off the mark here, but the fact is that many journalists today do come to conclusions. There's a very robust and growing journalism of opinion and uh, a growing number of journals of opinion and bloggers. The debate uh, is probably, that debate is more robust than it's ever been. What is malnourished and under... Uh, served both by audiences and by journalists is original reporting of facts that uncover what's going on. Uh, that's the foundation upon which the journalism of opinion is built. Uh, our journalism of verification of fact, of information, is the is the thing that we need to not abandon. And Cunningham's uh, argument, which is basically for a partisan journalism, although he he won't call it that. Uh, moves us further away and will just weaken the foundation of a, of a journalism of, of verification. There's no shortage of a journalism of opinion. Um, there's more of it than there has ever been, at least since Columbia. No, there's more of it than there's ever been in the United States. There's no absence of that. That's not the problem. And I guess the... Uh Going, well, let's let's move to the uh, the different principles and um, the. Can you give an overview of some of the the, the principles of uh, what journalism should strive to be? Well, uh, journalists agree, and more importantly, citizens demand a few basic things from journalism. Those are first that journalists should try and get the facts right. They should tell the truth. Uh, truth, uh, not in an abstract undergraduate philosophy class sense, but tell me what happened. Uh, what did the president say? What did he not say? And to the extent that you can get at it, uh, why? Um, not to derive all the meaning from that, but just to tell me uh, what occurred in the public square. Um, Second, journalists owe all of their loyalty to their audience, not to their companies, uh, not to their careers, but to uh, the citizens in their country and the audience that, uh, uh, with whom they have a bond. That connection, that allegiance, is the thing that will protect them and insulate them from all the various pressures that journalists face and will be their guide for how to make the right choices. Um, 
uh, a third core principle is that they be independent, independent of faction, that they not be secretly writing speeches for one side or the other, that they not get too close to one side or the other. That doesn't mean that journalists have to be neutral. It does mean, however, that they need to come to independent judgments and that their purpose to be to inspire debate among citizens, not to have a, a certain outcome uh, occur in the, in the political um, spectrum, which is why it's not the job of journalists to decide or try and determine whether the country go to war or not go to war. Uh, in fact, it's important that journalists maintain an open mind for as long as they possibly can uh, and not jump to conclusions and try and shed as much as they can their partisanship that they personally may feel underneath their work. Okay. And um, can you also talk about uh, keeping news uh, comprehensive and proportional? Yeah. In many ways, Journalists need to think that what they're producing each day is a map, a map for their fellow citizens to know how to navigate uh, their way through the culture and through the society. That map analogy is helpful because it shows us that uh, the news needs to be comprehensive. We can't leave things off of the map. We need to describe everything that we can that people would need to have to navigate. And the second uh, thing that the map analogy tells us is that the map needs to be kept in proportion. Proportionality, of course, is a rough estimate based on what a journalist thinks is important. But it means that if you take the Lacey Peterson murder trial and, and write about it as if it's uh, the impeachment of the president, that you're distorting the things on the map. You're turning England into a country that's the size of Greenland when it's really not that big. Um, things need to be kept in some rough estimate of their significance so that um, the citizens know, you know what matters and what doesn't. It's not that one journalist determines that for everybody, but if all journalists individually are trying to keep proportionality in mind, then the society gets a kind of a, a rough consensus of, of uh, what matters and what doesn't because as we reflect the arguments of uh, elites and, and, and general citizens and others, we get a sense of, of who we are and what our values are. And when you look at the, the month of October of 2002, why was the sniper case such a big story nationally? Well, um, it was a big story here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, the, it, the sniper case was. Right. Uh, the sniper story was a was a, a dramatic and significant story because um, you had a whole region, people in uh, more than one state, uh, afraid to buy gas. Um, it, it, that I think in any era, uh, be it the tabloid era that we might be in now, or or a more uh, sort of uh, serious era of news, I think that would have been a major story. Um, these people were on a massive killing spree uh, and the police were unable to catch them and everyone and anyone, regardless of where they lived or uh, who they were, might be an innocent victim. The randomness of it and the sheer terror that it, that it invoked uh, was extraordinary. I guess the issue is is when you in a television news organization may have ten stories a night, does this story really justify four or five stories with all these sort of enterprising stories that add nothing to the safety of people in Oregon? Um, well, I don't know. I don't. I mean, I don't have content data that tells me that they were doing four stories or five stories on the nightly news on this. I don't know that that's the case. I thought the cable coverage of the sniper was was completely out of control and probably a low point for cable, but it, um, it, it that had to do with the nature of the of the stories they were doing. The amount of story I mean, cable is in some ways a lost cause. They overcover every story. They only really cover four stories a day on cable news, and they overcover all four of them. And that's they do that because it's cheaper than than covering a lot of stories in a serious way. And can you talk about um, you know the 
the, the analysis of the state of the news media? You know, what sort of conclusions or insights did you gain on, uh, let's say, the television news media and how, um, what did you find from them? Well, uh, you have to divide television news media into three distinct parts. There's broadcast, network broadcast television, and there are key differences depending on the time of day. Uh, there's network, I mean, there's a cable television, um, and then there's local television news. Network television news uh, has actually become more serious in the last few years, particularly evening news. Um, during the 90s, the number one topic on network TV evening news was crime, even though crime was declining uh, across the country. That sort of fascination, that OJification, if you will, of the evening news is over. Um, international events are much more important on network evening news than they used to be. Obviously, September 11 had something to do with that. And they've come to discover, I think, in general, that um, the audience that's, uh, that watches those programs is still a sort of more serious news audience. Morning television network news is um, somewhat more uh, entertainment focused and softer. Um, although it too is more serious than before 9-11. Cable news is a different breed of cat. It, uh, first of all, is not built around storytelling. It's built around uh, live reporter stand-ups and live interviews. Although they're on 24 hours a day, uh, they really focus on four stories a day uh, and many, many topics. Most of the news agenda is left out. There's usually politics, crime, um, some soap opera kind of story and, and, and celebrity is very important. Um, uh, politics is a major issue and, and given the events in the world, uh, Iraq is also very important. Um, local TV news um, is largely built around mundane incidents, crimes, fires, accidents, things that are very predictable, uh, things that are guaranteed to sort of generate stories. Politics is a is a minor issue. Crime represents, crime, fires, and accidents represent about thirty percent of the stories on local TV news, but uh, closer to fifty percent of the lead stories. Um, and uh, uh, all of television is suffering quite mightily. Um, declining audience, almost one percent of the audience a year is is leaving television news, um, except for cable, and. Um, uh, uh, the economics of, of television are becoming increasingly difficult, um, and uh, uh, you know, journalism on television is is sort of in a is in a dire position, and television is also suffering more audience loss to the internet than any other medium. And uh, do you see any sort of um, what there's there's two arguments, I guess of. of who, what has more influence? Uh, the people on the right say journalists have, are, are, are biased liberally and that dictates their coverage. And then people on the uh, left will say, no, it's, it's all ownership based and that dictates. Can you speak to kind of that debate and more, you know, your sense of, of what is actually happening? In well, the problem with the debate over bias is that both sides are just right enough that they can't resolve this issue. Um, ownership is, uh, plays a huge role in setting the budgets, deciding who the bosses are going to be, how much resources, what the profit margins are going to be, in, in, in deciding the quality of news. They create in, in that way a whole set of biases that influence the press coverage we get, um, as does um, um, uh, the uh, uh, certain journalistic mores that give an establishment bias to coverage. Uh, we cover officials, we cover experts, we cover the establishment, and uh, the non-establishment view tends to be shut out, not because of ownership, but because of certain journalistic routines. On the other hand, the conservative critique, uh, although exaggerated, uh, has some merit as well. Uh, there are more liberals than, than conservatives uh, in newsrooms and in, and surveys would suggest that the number of people who self-identify themselves as conservatives in newsrooms is declining. While I think the uh, the critique on the right by some that there's some manifest conspiracy by uh, people who are more liberal in the news uh, 
to help the Democratic Party and somehow weaken the Republican Party, I think that's manifestly untrue. But the imbalance, the absence of conservative voices in the making of news in newsrooms is a problem, a problem that uh, journalists need to come to grips with and that they basically won't face. And do you see that um, liberal bias has more of an effect on domestic issues as opposed to uh, foreign policy issues such as Iraq? Sure. I, I mean, I think generally we've known uh, for a long time that there is a tends to be more bipartisan consensus uh, uh, on foreign policy than there is on domestic policy. Uh, leaders in both parties, when they're in control of the House and Senate, tend to follow the president. Uh, there's a kind of courtesy. Uh, it's it's built into the Constitution that the president has more leeway on foreign policy initially uh, in colonial times. I mean, in uh, in uh, in uh, I'm sorry. Uh, initially, uh, in the earliest days of the, of the country, the president was perceived as largely having uh, his duties limited to foreign policy, and and Congress was more of a domestic body. Um, and the press tends to reflect that political sensibility. Um, uh, you know, I think that the ideology of the press, if you were to map it, wouldn't really follow one party per se. Uh, I think you'd probably see a free trade orientation uh, in the press, um, a, a uh, uh, sort of social justice agenda in the press to help the little guy, to be a voice for the little guy. Um, um, and yet there's a fiscal conservatism in the press that uh, sort of howls about deficits and things like that. So if you look at it closely, while there is a problem of liberal bias and there's a problem of conglomeration and there's a problem of declining resources, it plays out in ways that don't neatly fit either side's critique. And do you see uh, a, a decline in uh, investigative journalism, both in the print and television? Well, the funny thing is that investigative journalism is one of the few things that the American public still sort of recognizes and respects about the press and in broadcast journalism it's one of the things that will build ratings the problem is that the kind of investigative journalism that we tend to see in broadcast is more consumer oriented it might be sort of faux investigative journalism are there dirty bed sheets in hotels, or is there bacteria in yogurt, or uh, will your bra stab you? All of which are actual stories that have run on uh, local news in many markets. These are not stories that are fulfill the obligation of the press as monitoring powerful institutions in society, looking for public malfeasance, and and watching um, the government to see whether it's. Um, sort of corrupting uh, or abusing the public trust. That's the real reason that we have a First Amendment and a watchdog role for the press. And you don't see as much of that in um, broadcast journalism, I think, as you should. We also see a decline overall in the percentage of investigative journalism in local television news. We've monitored that and mapped that. Um, it was never high. Um, but it has declined as resources have become scarcer. Um, in print, it's a little harder to say. There's a whole architecture of contests and awards in print uh, that sustain and nurture investigative reporting. I'm not sure, however, whether some of that investigative work you see in, in print is sort of remote, is, is isolated from the rest of the coverage. Uh, you know, you'll you'll have a team that will do sort of a massive ten-part series on something, and it doesn't really integrate or infiltrate uh, the paper overall. Um, the sort of watchdog uh, function on a day-to-day -day basis um, that we might expect the press to do is some uh, somehow harder to integrate. Uh, you know, were we watchful and a watchdog over the debate? in advance of the war in Iraq is a harder argument to make than, you know, uh, did we do 10, you know, good investigative projects last year that were sort of planned out ahead of time and had to do with the sewer system or the roads or police or something like that. And 
can you talk to uh, challenging power, balancing that with maintaining access, and also with kind of the, the patriotism, you know, that, that influx? And does that have to do with, you know, economics? Or just talk about all those, those factors. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, first of all, the press is not ever really going to function as a surrogate opposition to the government. Um, the press, first of all, is a, is a, a conduit um, for people to talk to each other and for officials uh, to talk to, to the public. Um, and so we're always going to be better, as journalists, at, at reflecting a, a debate than creating it. Um, uh, it is the job of the press to, uh, to speak truth to power, to confront powerful institutions with um, you know, with information that is true, particularly if the powerful are trying to promulgate information that is untrue. Um, and that may be where the issue of the war in Iraq, uh, you know, becomes a real problem for journalists. Um, doing that um, is made more difficult when uh, resources are stretched thinner. The corporatization and the profit demands and the stock price demands that are on the media have overall, if you were going to generalize, resulted in fewer reporters with less time to do their stories, more space to fill, um, stretching people and resources thinner, and that makes journalism harder to do. It also has added to pressure to sort of find stories that are cost effective and that will generate an audience, and those sort of pl pleasing and easy stories uh, built around celebrity or things like that, take us and our time away from uh, more serious concerns of trying to make this significant interesting. All of those are pressures and realities that make journalism more difficult. Then that you add to that the crisis mentality or the rallying around the ra flag effect that occurs when a country is under attack. The president has an, a, a reservoir of support and it becomes more difficult for journalists to do their job w during those moments because uh, if you want to challenge the president, um, a president can say, hey, you know, who are you? You're being unpatriotic. Who are you as a press? You're, you're liberal. Who are you as a press? You're, you're getting in the way of democracy functioning. Um, uh, and politicians of either party are going to do that. Uh, when challenged, they're you know they're they're not there to make the press's job easier. They're there to to you know promote their policies. And so, at those moments when the president is particularly popular and the press is less popular, uh, telling people controversial things that they may not want to hear becomes more difficult. Doesn't mean we don't do it or shouldn't do it, but we have to be smarter and 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 more thoughtful in how we present information to people that they don't want to hear. And looking at kind of the institutional biases of, of all corporations and almost in, and in some ways, well, especially with the corporations in America, is that they have to externalize certain costs that's not going to serve their ultimate, you know, the shareholders to make profits. And is the public interest being externalized in this, you know, uh, paradigm is that it's not really being in you know, there's no check on what the public is getting, and so is that resulting in more infotainment? Well, you know, the, the paradox is that after 9-11, uh, the press in America spent a lot of money uh, just serving the public interest. They, they went on the air. They, they didn't run ads for weeks at a time. They spent an enormous amount of money covering the war in Iraq. They spent an enormous amount of cover money covering the war in Afghanistan. They spent an enormous amount of money covering what happened on 9-11. Uh, those were expensive propositions. Uh, they did that, however, in part because had they not, uh, the public would have been outraged and their credibility would have been severely damaged. Um, there are moments when the press does uh, things because the public expects it and would back and there'd be a backlash if they didn't. The real test is doing things uh, when the public doesn't care, uh, and the run-up to the war in Iraq is is one such case. Uh, the public was supportive, largely, of the president. Uh, 
and the press acquiesced to that because uh, the alternative in trying to dig into these things was en enormously difficult. Uh, covering a debate uh, uh, in, 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 um, across the country in official and unofficial places that questioned the war uh, was, uh, although it, the popularity wasn't the issue, it just wasn't an argument that was going to win the day and the press sort of uh, at, reacted in conventional ways of covering the arguments that were going to win and not covering arguments uh, based on their potential merits. Um, and um, to some extent, um, the press was more accepting of what officials had to say because they didn't expect some of these officials to be misleading them as much as it turns out that they were misled. So did the, should the press assume that the governments always lie? I mean, always be skeptical, a healthy skepticism? Well, there's a difference between a health, healthy skepticism and assuming that government officials always lie, which is a, probably an unhealthy cynicism. Um, you know, it, it's not good for journalists or the country if, if our uh, public officials have severe credibility problems. In the end, Vietnam was damaging to journalism, even though it, it, you know, it led to sort of a heightened respect for the press. It created a kind of cynicism in the press about government that uh, then reinforced by Watergate you know, led to a, a period, I think, in the uh, 80s and 90s of real deep cynicism about public officials uh, and an, uh, an erosion of uh, the relationship uh, and, and has led to the kind of Machiavellian manipulative and uh, coercive relationship that we now have between journalists and the people they cover. And w in the case of the buildup to the war in Iraq, there, there seemed to be a disproportionate representation of skeptical voices, that anywhere from uh, 40 to 60 percent of Americans wanted more time for inspections. Mm -hmm. But those voices were, there's, you know, if you look at the television news media leading up to this time period, you hardly see, you know, it, it's certainly not anywhere close to, it may be 5 to 10 percent, but it's nowhere near 40 percent of the coverage expressing this viewpoint. Yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, that's sort of difficult. I don't know that, you know, the press is, should or can uh, sort of weigh public opinion and then, re and then have its news coverage reflect in a, a perfect balance what that opinion is. I mean, if you, if you air the polls suggesting that people want more time for uh, inspections, um, you know, the president also tends to have a, have a sway over public opinion when he says, you know, that won't do any good. Um, and, and the president may have had a credible argument there as well. Um, more time for inspections, I suspect, even Hans Blix, uh, you know, thought uh, might not have yielded much more. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that because I think he may have argued the opposite. But um, sort of scratch that and say, um, you know, I think that the, pro the if the president had argued that, when the president did argue that, that um, more time for inspections were, were not going to make any difference, I suspect that a majority of Americans probably agreed with that. Um, they just didn't really, you know, want to rush to war. But when, an, when the president is trying to discredit this weapons inspections process, why not go to former inspectors uh, on the both sides? You know, Scott Ritter or someone who's actually studied the declassified document history from the Gulf War Syndrome released from the CIA, John Prados of the National Security Archive. These people are out there who have been looking at this issue for a number of years, who have on-the-field experience, who were just shut out, almost editorially, just like it doesn't matter. Well, I think that, the, again, we are covering the same ground as we covered before. I think the press uh, decided it didn't matter, that the, that the administration had made up its mind, was going to do what it was going to do, and with the real politic mentality that the press uh, operates under, probably to a fault, um, they decided that uh, politically these counterarguments weren't going to have any impact. I guess my, what I'm searching for is a solution in a way. Like, how do we... We look at what happened. We see you can see it clear as day in hindsight, but it may happen again. Right. And if the Republicans and Democrats agree on many issues, they agree on many issues that are very critical for uh, around the world. You know, if there's a, how do you 
legitimize a critical mass of people or you know academics experts is that the role of the journalists did they fail what happened you know the, the question of whether or not the press failed uh, in creating a critical mass of opinion that might have changed the course of the country going to war is is very important in the end I suspect, but I can't say for sure, that it wouldn't have mattered. That the Bush administration appears from all uh, evidence that I can see that it was going to do this, even in the face of, of almost universal, not quite universal, but almost international uh, objection. Um, the press, I suspect, in the end, did not do enough. Would it have made a difference? We'll never know. But I think the answer is probably not. Most of the history of journalism suggests that the press will never, in the end, serve as a kind of surrogate opposition. Once the Democrats decided to acquiesce to this, um, and the president so obviously wanted to do this, uh, I don't think there's any stopping them. The press, while a very powerful institution, is not, in the end, an actor in policy making. Um, and the public uh, in this country tends to follow where its national leader wants to go on international policy. Um, if going to war was a mistake, that's a mistake that the president made and was going to make regardless. Okay. And let's see. Um, and how do you see, um, do you see that the role of public relations and uh, sophisticated persuasion techniques that are, are being more and more incorporated, uh, government officials being media trained, mm -hmm. is that can you talk to the public relations and how uh, the, it interacts with journalism and, and are there ways to counteract it? This? Yeah. One of the fundamental problems facing journalism today is that we are more corporate. We are more focused on demographics and audience and, and, and delivering an audience to advertisers. We are somewhat less insulated from that and, and somewhat less see ourselves as just operating in the public interest. That results in, you know, our, in infotainment, in, in, in stretched resources, and a variety of other things. Matched against that is greater sophistication than ever on the part of policymakers and politicians on how to manipulate us. For years, they have studied us more carefully than we've studied ourselves. They understand our tendencies better than we understand them ourselves. They understand our weaknesses better than we understand them ourselves. Um, and so you have, in a way, a distracted press corps and a thinner press corps uh, matched against a more sophisticated um, uh, government and, and political body that is out to sort of use us. The fight is unbalanced in, in, a, in a sense if indeed their, the relationship between journalists and, and policymakers is a fight, there is an inevitable tension there. And um, our response tends to be to doubt them and to try and filter what they say or to pull back the curtain and reveal that these things are concocted or, um, or this is spin as opposed to just um, policy rhetoric. But I, I think that's in, probably an inadequate response. Um, also, that's not interesting to the public. They don't care. Um, and so in our political coverage, you see more and more coverage about polling and about spin doctors and consultants and not about policy. Uh, the public doesn't respond to that insider coverage, but that's the response that journalists tend to have to, uh, to try and react to the growing sophistication of the people who would manipulate them. So we need to come up with a better response, but there's no question that uh, 
people all throughout the government uh, for many years now have understood how to manipulate the press better than the press has understood those manipulations. Do you see that the issue of sound bites um, matched up with um, long uh, debates? I think um, you, know, you have a sense where debates are very shortened in a way to very, you know, uh, 15 to 20 second sound bites and entire issues debating. Eight seconds, six Eight. seconds. Okay, right. Um, yes, I mean, uh, there's no doubt that an electronic media world, uh, the television world, um, that is uh, more truncated than it's ever been. Um, and is more distracted by events and declining audience and economic pressures than it's ever been, is less well equipped to handle complexity. Um, even though we have more tools technologically, we can uh, we can intersplice messages from around the world into one piece and get satellite footage and match things up and check facts. So we have more capability from a technical standpoint the end product, particularly in the cable environment of 24-hour ongoing constant news, the ability to sort of handle complexity um, in, in, in electronic journalism is probably um, weaker than it used to be when um, you had a sense that the audience wasn't distracted, that they were going to sit down and they were going to watch this show and pay attention regardless of how complex the issue might be. Um, now there's a feeling that you've got to sort of wave a colored rag and say, sit, watch for a few minutes, and, you know, I won't bore you, I promise. We'll do this fast, it'll be painless, uh, and we'll move on. In, in looking at the, the build-up to the war in Iraq, there seem to be things that shift in um, rhetoric, say, a regime change to uh, weapons of mass destruction. And does there need to be uh, a beat where they're looking at the public record over a long period of time so they can notice these changes and try to explain them? I mean, well, that's everyone's beat. Uh, you know, I mean, the problem is that we're a country of amnesiacs uh, communicated to by a profession of people who are extreme amnesiacs. Uh, in journalism, we don't tend to keep files and, and, and have a long memory. There was some coverage of that. Um, but again, in the end, the press needs a robust party of opposition uh, to do its job well because it can't be relied on to, to, to supply that for itself. Um, I think that was covered, but, um, you know, the, the public is, tends to be trusting of its leaders. And if the leaders want to lead in a certain direction um, to make that stop, requires something more than just journalism. And a uh, final question, why did we go to war? Because the president wanted to. Now, I guess, that, is that the role of journalists, is to, to, to tell us? I mean, is that, is that a legitimate answer, you know, like, just because he wanted to? Why? What is our self-interest? There seems to be more <laughs> drive there as to why. I mean, that's beyond my area of expertise. <laughs> Why did we go to war? Okay. And is that something that everyone should know? I mean, we didn't, we it's didn't, a, it's a, it's a very you know, question. we didn't go to war because of the something the press didn't do. It's more complicated than that. Okay. And let me just sit here for uh, a couple seconds just to uh, get um, room tone. To just right.